All right, guys, it's time for another episode of the Real MVP Podcast. I've got Saul Bookman, a.k.a. Bruce Leroy. I've got Tristan, a.k.a. Vanity. I guess that makes me Eddie Arcadian. We're going to be talking about this movie from 1985. <laughs> Kristen, give me one word for this movie. What you got? Ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go second. I'm just going to make a sound. There's a lot of... That's all. Bring us on. What you got? One word. Ah, uh, karate. <laughs> the last dragon. The real MVP. Begin. Guys, it's time for another episode of the Real MVP podcast. We're going back to 1985. We're going to be talking about The Last Dragon, and I have to start with an important first question. Is this podcast the meanest? (laughs) Is this podcast the prettiest? I mean, I'm setting Saul up for the perfect callback. And well, I, think, I thought I think you should just keep going. Let's go. Yeah. I want to hear you finish it off. Is this is this podcast the baddest mofo in town? You yeah, show enough. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the martial arts and questionable sports film, The Last Dragon. I've got Saul Bookman. I've got Kristen McDougal with me. And first of all, there's a lot to lot to get through in this movie. Saul, this was your pick. Before we get into it very deeply, I'm assuming most people listening to this are familiar with this movie. And if not, I would pause this and go spend an hour and 50 minutes of your life getting into it. But give me, I'm going to give you about 10 10 to 15 seconds. Give me the plot of The Last Dragon. It is crazy dangerous in New York City, but there is a hero among us that will lead us to the promised land by the way of karate and his name is Bruce Leroy and he must avenge the bad stuff going on in the city by the hands of Shonuff. And he does so with his posse of uh, dojo people or people in his dojo. There you go. Roughly. It's awesome. It's an amazing movie. I don't need to sell it. You just watch the first five minutes and you're hooked. So, for Chris and I, I think I speak for both of us. This was our first time viewing a very classic film. Now, this comes out in March of 1985. It's famous uh, for a lot of reasons, um, namely its executive producer. So I'll talk about the executive producer. This is a, this is a Motown Records project. Oh, yeah, yeah. Barry Gordy, the one that actually brought the Jackson 5 uh, alive and onto Motown Records and then obviously led to Michael Jackson. But uh, that's the kind of their claim to fame. And, and obviously we all know the history of Motown. I mean, you can't, um, Barry Gordy is just a legendary uh, figure in Motown history. So uh, he wanted to make a movie and this is what they came up with. And I, <laughs> it's just awesome, dude. It's just a great movie. I'm so lucky he had Jackson vibe because his movie career was not going anywhere else. <sighs> So it comes out March 22nd, 1985. These are the other movies it opened up against. It, it finished uh, It finished fourth uh, that, that week in the box office. Friday the 13th, part five. So Freddy Krueger, they were already up to the fifth one. It opened against it brand new. Porky's Revenge, the sequel to Porky's, <laughs> which we will not be covering on the Real MVP podcast or ever referencing again. Um, slightly more offensive than this movie, actually. Uh, the Last Dragon, and also... This is like uh, this is a classic Kelman childhood movie, Baby: Secret of the Lost Legend, which is just a great cheesy, awful dinosaur movie that I loved when I was six years old. So that's but, all you uh, know about this podcast is that it's this, behind those. Yeah, th- this movie has a Beverly Hills Cop was still open and uh, it made a little bit less money than Last Dragon at that time. So um, it has a ten million dollar budget. It makes a very respectable thirty three million dollars. I am sure it made an extra few dollars from Saul on VHS, DVD, Laserdisc, DVD, and Blu-ray, as well as the tape soundtrack. Saul, give me your personal history with The Last Dragon. Why did you pick this movie? Well, you know, first of all, I I tried to fit this, and I feel like I really did fit this in the world of MMA. And since that's so popular nowadays, I figured we should – we should watch a fighting movie that was more than just two guys boxing or, or arm wrestling or anything like that. So 
that's why I feel like this is a sports movie to a degree. I agree. I probably pushed the envelope on that, but that's fine. However, just the, I've seen so many movies that were like, you know, the bad guy versus the good guy and how this all works out. This one was probably the most creative in breaking so many stereotypes <laughs> or maybe indulging them. I don't know whatever the perspective you have is. Uh, and it was just a very different way. And, and I mean, let's be honest. Okay. We've, we, there's a lot of karate movies and Kung Fu movies out there. Um, a lot of them are played by predominantly Asian um, cast members. This one breaks the mold and has the black guy as the hero. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of black heroes in movies. Like you had Shaft, maybe a couple other ones. That's about it. And so now you got Bruce Leroy coming to save the day. And it was amazing. By the way, uh, I mentioned Beverly Hills Cop, which broke all sorts of records. It was out at the same time. I would like to have seen Eddie Murphy in this role instead of Timac. We'll get more into that a little bit later. But, I mean, just give me like a, I, this movie. Are you, impressed, lacked, are, you, are you impressed by Eddie Murphy's physique? I'm saying this movie, the star power in it lacks a certain je ne sais quoi. You know, there's, there's definitely like a lot of people that I never heard of. You didn't really hear from again. And we're going to get into this a little bit later. There are some people that auditioned for both Show Enough's part and Bruce Leroy's part that I'm like, dude, give me Denzel Washington. He auditioned for both those dudes. Give me Lawrence Fishburne, star of Searching for Bobby Fisher. He auditioned for Bruce Leroy. There was some, there was some more star power that they left on the table because they wanted – this guy was actually like a black belt. He's like a legit martial arts dude. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, that's why you got stuntmen. You know, that's why you got a stuntman. Yeah. Oh, not that last scene though. I mean, anyway, we'll go, go, ahead, go ahead, Kristen. Well, I want to know why they didn't cast them. I feel like they're keyed in on that. Well, in hindsight, it's always twenty twenty. You could always be like, you know, nobody knew any of those guys until they blossomed in their careers later on. Maybe the reason why they didn't blossom was because they did such a great job in the Last Dragon that just it was just downhill from there. Yeah, but he wasn't an actor. I thought it was even better that he wasn't an actor. We're, we're going to get into, I want to get into this a little bit more about the guys that audition a little bit later, but Kristen, I want you to, again, I, I put a chess movie in front of you guys a while back. Uh, yeah, also so respectful to ask after searching for Bobby Fisher, was this a sports movie? And we so graciously said, absolutely. And then I'm watching this one thinking no shot in hell is this. A <laughs> there was a tournament at the end. Thank you. The closest. I you're, okay, first of all, so I was calling this a tournament, and I'm not sure if a street fighting scene in a warehouse constitutes any sort of tournament. So if you're looking for a sports movie, don't watch this one. But it was it was a whole, yeah, it was, there, it was a lot in this one. There is experience, was it not? There is some martial arts training in this movie, and the bad guy Eddie Arcadian says, "Let the games begin," which I think is what Saul is calling a tournament. Uh, no, he says. And I quote, welcome to a tournament in your honor, Bruce Leroy. He calls it a tournament himself. He actually gets guys to fight him round after round. And then it looks like when our hero is about to falter, here comes the dojo. Mm. I'm still not buying it. You're not selling it. I watched the whole thing all two hours of my life that I'm never going to get back. For the, yeah. Movie. The people that have listened to our podcast are like, yo, are these guys going to talk about like sports movies at all? <laughs> like, I, I think they're, we haven't done a lot of uh, truth right. and advertising. Chris, Kristen's going to save the day, I'm sure. So, all right, that gets to one of the first things I like to ask you guys, which is, are we sure the good guy is the good guy in this? Are we sure Bruce, Bruce Leroy is the protagonist and show enough, the Shogun of Harlem is the bad guy? What makes Shogun the bad guy? Yeah, actually nothing really, honestly, nothing really makes him the bad guy. He just wanted to be the master. So therefore he wanted to fight and beat. Yeah, he definitely wasn't rude by busting into the movie theater and stopping the movie and being a complete jerk about everything and then wanting to fight Bruce Leroy who was just trying to watch a nice Kung Fu flick. Like really, that's, that's a good guy in your opinion? Like that's that's cool. That's fine. What if, what, if you, what, if, what if you guys were at the movies and I just busted in, turned on the lights, and wanted to fight you? Would I be a good guy? 
First but of all, more of a distraction. I think the bad guy was the one trying to take down the whole Seventh Heaven studio. He was the real bad guy. It was sure, not Big Mac. Sure, but we're talking about these two guys. And so yeah, who's, who's the bad guy comparatively? First of all, I want to say two things. One, I think like somebody, didn't they bust out like a, a boom box in the middle of the theater and start break dancing? So I don't think that show enough was the original bad guy. I actually think he shut oh. down the people that were already disrupting the movie. So he was actually trying to bring peace to that movie theater. Uh, he wasn't even in the movie theater when that happened. So that that argument is completely. But they broke, he broke. He broke the music that was very disruptive. By the way, that's the victory. He theater didn't break the music. He didn't break the music. It was the other guy sitting in the audience. He jumped up, and then smashed the radio. Well, he did destroy the he did destroy the pizzeria. The, the pizza parlor is the, is the worst thing that he's done at that point. But. Yeah, Here's here's my main thing. Okay, first of all, Bruce Leroy is boring. He's boring. I, I mean, no disrespect to Ty Mack, who did a very, you know, he did the best he could with this. He wasn't uh, the guys who auditioned for this, which include Wesley Snipes would have been better. Mario Van Peebles would have been better. Lawrence Fishburne would have been better. Or Denzel Washington, who would have won an Oscar for this movie. But he's boring. And there's a long line of, you know, a lot of times, like, the villain is more interesting than the good guy. Like, the Joker... Is way more interesting than Batman. Correct. Dark Vader is way more interesting than Luke Skywalker. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't, I don't quite understand what Bruce Leroy's motivation is, except to get the glow. Okay. First of all, Shonuff has the glow, so we know he's good at martial arts. You know, I'm just not sold. Like he wants power. He wants to be the best. I think, like in a sports movie, we should celebrate somebody who wants to be the best, and he's not boring. Like. Who would you rather see a sequel about? You want to see more show enough or you want to go back and watch more of like Bruce Leroy eating popcorn with chopsticks? No, show enough for sure was just on the quest to be the best. And we have to appreciate that hustle. All right. Listen up. The basic principles of Kung Fu, the concept of Kung Fu revolves three basic principles, motivation, self-discipline, and time. And according to experts, the real motivation behind learning Kung Fu is inspiration and not force, which should come from an inner craving to learn and develop the mind and the body. That is exactly what Tai Mac did. He absolutely personified Kung Fu. Well, to that's it doesn't mean he's not boring. Oh, sure, sure. But he played his role to a T. Inner peace, calmness, mind, body, and soul. Whereas Shonuf took the principles of fighting from Kung Fu and completely disregarded the rest. He and was like, I just want to fight everybody, anybody, and show that I'm the master. What kind of selfish prick is that guy? That's like, called on. innovation. That's called you live in Harlem and you are adapting. I mean, okay. another movie. Yeah, another movie from I think this year. That movie this came out, like Karate Kid. You you want to be the best around, not like be the quietest, most feeble. You know, he's like Time Mac is so. By the way, Chris, this is more a question for you. I think he's like so handsome. Like he's 1985 oh, yeah. handsome and also very 2020 handsome. Oh yeah, that couple, him and Vanity, it's a pretty good looking couple. I mean, he's like almost, I think he's 55 now. Well, I'm not and, looking at 55 now. I'm looking at 95. Well, well, you should. If you look him up at 55 years old, the dude is still shredded and ripped and like model, like good looking. Like he's a good looking dude. I ain't gonna lie. All right. Well, so, uh, as, a, as a young uh, guy who had this movie on, maybe you had this on like beta or VHS or whatever. How did we feel about vanity? Oh yeah. All the feels. <laughs> All the feels. She was amazing and just super gorgeous. Like, R.I.P. But yeah, she was yeah. awesome. So but vanity. It bugged, me. it bugged me. God, I just like was watching this whole movie. And it was bothering me that he just kept turning her down. I even texted Saul. I was like, "She's mega babe." She is. She he is turning her down. I'm so bothered because he her. can't. He can't focus on his ultimate goal if he's got her in the way. Like, nah, I oh gotta. God. I gotta reach the final level. And I can't do this with you in the way. That's it. Nobody is going to stand in my way to find that ultimate final level. Should That's I get it. like deep in the weeds here and make this political and say like they portrayed woman to be a distraction? Oh my god! <laughs> so vanity. Just I think most people who have seen this probably know a little bit about her. By the way, I like a movie. I I, I would sign up for any movie where the two leads go by one name, Ty Mac and Vanity. 
Vanity was a pseudonym given to her by Prince. She was one of Prince's proteges. Uh, I think they were romantically involved for a while. He discovered her. Um, you know, she was in some of his projects. Um, if you believe what you read on the internet, Prince wanted her to go by the pseudonym. Do you guys know what she was supposed to go by? Hmm. This is a word I didn't think I'd be saying on the Real MVP podcast. He asked her to go by vagina, but... <laughs> But we had to settle for vanity. But we had to go with vanity. Uh, <laughs> I did not know that. I want to start something new on this show. Um, we talked about some of the different actors. We obviously just talked about the stars, the single name stars, Ty Mac and Vanity. We're calling her Vanity. Um, I, I want to talk about the sixth man, which can be a man or a woman, but like kind of your, your lead person off the bench. The two leads in this, not a ton of other work on IMDb, but there are a lot of famous people that could be your sixth man of the year in this movie. Um, uh, Mike Starr, who plays the big uh, the big guy that's uh, Arcadian's henchman. Uh, I know him from Dumb and Dumber. That uh, You guys probably recognize him from that. Um, this is, I think, the sixth or seventh movie for William H. Macy, also from Searching for Bobby Fischer, where there's a very loud jacket in this. Back then, he just went by W.H. Macy, but this is one of the most accomplished actors of the last 30 years. He has a bit part in this. Chaz Palminteri, who I think most people know from A Bronx Tale or from The Usual Suspects. He's a car driver in this. He's basically a nobody. And then last one is uh, Natasha, who goes by a couple of names, My Little Lotus Flower, uh, his little sister, Bruce Leroy's little sister. Did you guys know who that was? Uh, yeah, uh, Keisha Pulliam from uh, The Cosby Show. It's Rudy Huxtable. So could, could, yeah, Keisha Knight Pulliam. Yep. Okay, yeah. so I was in it for about what twenty seconds max on screen. Yeah, something like that. So for you guys, who out, out of those four, who who would you give a sixth man to? Um, I'd probably say William H Macy for me. Was he's he been the, he's been in a lot of good movies. Was he? Well, the, he he's uh, he's the one that's trying con to convince Laura. Um, to take a meeting with meeting with Eddie Arcadian to begin with. We're just she says no. <laughs> all this stuff is just gonna rely on Saul's uh, information. Yeah. So um he was also okay. in Boogie, he was also in Boogie Nights with a couple memorable scenes. Um there, yeah. is, there was a lot of characters in the beginning and a lot of storylines going around. I didn't know how they were gonna tie them all together. This one was confusing for me to start. On uh, this podcast, we're going to talk a lot about like little kid actors. There's a lot of famous kid sports movies. You got like Rookie of the Year, Bad News Bears, Mighty Ducks, Little Giants. I am sure at some point when we actually start talking about sports movies, we'll talk about kid actors. Uh, two kid actors that I want to talk about. Saul, you grew up with this movie. How do we feel about Richie, Leo O'Brien, like the little brother who has kind of a weird crush on Vanity? How do we how do we feel about him? Uh, he's useless to the whole story. I could get, I could be done with him. I, mean, I, I didn't like him at all. He's not even the best kid actor in the whole movie. I, I believe you're talking about Ty. I believe you were talking about Ernie Reyes Jr., who, let's be honest, just, he's like the most sportsy thing in this movie. I know him. I knew I recognized him. He is Kino in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, yep. The Secret of the Ooze. <laughs> Does yep. martial arts, by Saul's definition, also a sports movie. You know, because like the foot soldiers fight in front of Shredder or something. But dude, Kristen, like the little kid, the little kid is like one of the better parts of Saul's quote unquote tournament. Yeah. Yeah. I, he is the part of the tournament, like for me. Like I, when he jumps. First of all, we need to do away with calling it a tournament. This when he fun. jumps off the stage and does that scissor kick. Oh my gosh, I almost jump out of my seat every single time. Like that was such a badass move from like a little eight-year-old. I know we just I just I always want to just look at my kids and like, what are you doing in life? Like, why can't you do these kind of things? I was trying to. <laughs> this is the second episode where we've criticized uh Saul's kids on the <laughs> podcast. So, you know. I have to say that like when I was a kid, like my dad and I would go to the local video store and we would like just go look for movies with ninja in the title. And there were a lot of them that were like not appropriate for kids, but there was like American Ninja one, like American Ninja three. I think a lot of these ended up playing on like Cinemax late at night, if you know what I'm saying. But like 
when I was a kid, like the eighties was like the heyday for martial arts movies. When you had, you know, Chuck Norris and Steven Seagal and Jean-Claude Van Damme and all these dudes. So, but I, but I'm guessing it's all like, this is your version of that movie. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the other thing about this is like, you have to understand the era and it was just a bunch of people making a bunch of karate movies and ninja movies and just all these different things. So why not put this into the fold? And I just, I loved it. I, I just think it's, it goes with the time and it gave people a different perspective and a different look to the Kung Fu and karate scene. What is it though about you men or young boys that are just so fascinated with you fighting? Men? That's so sexist. The ninja, the young, like that, that couldn't have done anything less for me, you know? And I think... You well, know, I mean, back in the day, I think it was just like it was I don't know if it was competition, but like, you know, we've all been in that situation where maybe we've been bullied and we want to overcome the bully. Right. I think we've all been in that position at one point or another. Maybe somebody pulled your hair or, you know, somebody like did something evil to you in school or something like that. Like I've been in that position. I had this jerk named Junior sitting behind me like and he was like a he was legit in a gang in the eighth grade like. And he always wanted to fight me. And I just, I think about these kind of things. And I'm like, man, if I knew karate, I'd kick this kid's ass. Would you have though? Uh, yeah. Kristen. Yeah, have you guys ever fought? Did you guys I think ever I, Actually, that, this is going to be my original opening question. I want to know if you, Kristen, have ever thrown a punch with purpose. Like, have you ever thrown a punch at someone with the intention of landing the punch? I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to my best friend, Bree. She witnessed the punch that I threw in college in college in a bar oh my god okay. this is suddenly the best episode of the real MVP. oh my gosh um it was an innocent punch but it was a punch I mean, is, there some, is there such a thing as an innocent punch yeah did you throw it like with intent to harm is my question no, I threw with the intent to back the hell up when your words were not enough. Did you did you land this punch? I, I need to know what happened. Pay, yeah. pay me a picture. Well, we were in the college bar and everyone was drinking and this this guy was just too close and we were not interested. And we said, can you please back up? And I don't know what alcohol does to people <laughs> that their ears suddenly shut off. And there was only one way to get this guy away from us. So you just punched him? Not in the face. Just Where'd there. you punch him? From the chest area. <laughs> it would have only been better if you would have hit him in the family jewels. I would have just, no. that would have been just too much. No, I didn't want to, like you said, I don't want to cause harm, but we needed to get this guy away from what, us. What was his <laughs> reaction when, 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 he did, when you did that? His friends were like, oh, yeah, okay, we got it. We got it. And then they're like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> this is, I love this. I, but I think, like, a lot of this is, like, wish fulfillment stuff, like, when you're a kid. Like, you know, I mean, you like action movies with, like, dudes with machine guns, but you're not going to, like, run around and shoot a bunch of people. But you like, I liked, you know, Commando and all those, I don't know, sort of, like, testosterone movies, even when I was, like, a little kid. And same thing with this, like... It's I don't like know. the hypothetical for you guys, right? You Just, what? It's like the hypothetical, like that hypothetical feeling that you would have somehow be in this situation, like sure, yeah, fighting to protect the pretty girl. Yeah, like I always, I always, it, honestly, when I'm driving down the road, sometimes I envision myself in a rap battle against some of my friends from back in the day. So, like Eight Mile really rings true to me. So there you go. <laughs> Which is a better sports movie than this movie, but we're, we're not. Oh, we're not. don't think that ain't coming up. <laughs> yeah, I don't want. To, I don't want you guys to get off the hook. Tell me, I don't know if you've been in a fight. I don't believe uh, that. Paul's been in a fight. No, I mean, I, I think I'm, my brain is racking. I know I have thrown one punch with purpose. Yeah. Uh, in middle school, I was the manager for the baseball team, which is what all the cool kids did then because I liked being around sports, kind of like my career now. And uh, the eighth grade, our middle school was seventh, eighth grade. And there was a kid on the team who was merciless to me. I mean, I was one of the littlest kids in uh, middle school. And he just was, he was riding me all the time. And I remember in, we were in the bathroom headed out towards the baseball field. And he said something to me that set me off. 
And um, I was a little guy. And so I had to like sort of punch up in the air. And it was like the perfect angle where I chinned him and he like scooted back like uh, like the dude, like the guys would fall down in um, Mike Tyson's punch out. And I like, he like landed against the wall, like a movie crash. And I, you know, I think I like looked at my fist, like, oh, I have real ultimate power. I got the glow. I got the glow. I didn't know what. <laughs> And you were the hero? You're the playground hero? Yeah, I did. I hit a bully. And honest to God, I, this is true. I think he never bothered me again. I think it was just like, I mean, it was kind of like the perfect size. Now, I have been leveled by my four-year-old who punched at a certain <laughs> height that I don't think I have to describe. And uh, it doesn't take like... You always got to cover the McNuggets. Yeah. <laughs> Like David versus Goliath, let's be honest. Like we know where he threw the stone. Like we know, you know, like we know where it landed. It didn't hit Goliath in the head. So I'm, yeah, I'm, so I've thrown one punch with purpose, but I've been but, I've been one fight my entire life. And it was on a playground at school at in high school. Actually, my freshman year of high school. And we used to always play basketball at lunch. And this one kid just you know, you ever meet that kid that's just jealous of you for no reason. Like, you're just like, why are you jealous of me? You're always like attacking me. Like, what's your deal? And finally, one time, like I hit a bucket and he hit me in the stomach. And I was like, yeah, this is it. I'm done. And so I threw him down. I actually had him pinned on the ground. His face was on the ground. My knees were around his head. And I, and I cocked back to just unload on him. And I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I don't have that in my soul. Like, I can't. I'm a lover, not you, a fighter. You were Bruce, Bruce Leroy. You used it for defense. You know, you used it for, for good purposes. I reached that upper, upper level. Mind, <laughs> body, and soul were all one. <laughs> it's a way of life. You found the master. In That's right. One of my favorite things to do in this podcast is take you to cliche hell. Uh, this movie has some sports movie cliches. It basically has every martial arts movie cliche. I'll open it up to you guys first. What what sports cliches? Where where are we going in cliche hell? What did you guys notice? The journey to find the one and only one that knows everything. So yeah, the the journey to find that the ultimate master. The enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we we have continually found the old wise master. Obviously, this one ended up being the fraud in the whole journey, but. The yeah, the wise master who is going to help Bruce Leroy find his you know spirit or brain or whatever he's looking. The for. Da the damsel in distress. Oh, the big damsel time. in distress. Yeah. yeah, several times actually, oh, several God, times. And the bad guy wants her, and the good guy gets her. Like there's always like one girl in all these towns. Like in New York City, there's like one girl that they're after, and she performs at seventh heaven in this movie. Uh, yeah, I had I had the uh, old guy trainer, like the old, you know, Asian trainer off the top of the movie, very much. Again, I think this came out either right around right after Karate Kid, but I was getting serious uh, Miyagi vibes out of his trainer. There's always unorthodox training. There's always, you know, whether I think in Kickboxer, Jean-Claude Van Damme had to kick down a tree, you know, being blindfolded, dodging a wrench. That's always a sports movie cliche. Um, in this one, I think trying to bat down arrows, I think would be considered a uh, unique training. What do you guys think? Oh yeah, absolutely. And how did you know? How did you know? And he's just like, Oh, I felt it sensei. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, that, and then, and then the other one, like, uh, obviously the precursor to the end, I mean, at the beginning when show enough goes to the theater and he's like, catches bullets with his teeth. You knew at some point. You had to see him catch a bullet with his teeth. I, yeah, um, I got I got one more that I think it's it's not just uh, the, now there isn't a training montage in this particular scene. There is a few montages. Uh, there isn't a lot of montages in this movie actually. But um, was it in the eighties then? Very clear. <laughs> this movie was most definitely in the eighties. <laughs> but. Uh, there's always like a signature song. There's always like a good, you know, whether it's uh, you're the best around or going to fly now in Rocky, Eye of the Tiger. Like there's usually a major song. This movie was designed to have some good songs in it. It has some, it has some stinkers. It has one particular banger. Tell me about the banger. So what's the two, two bangers. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. Two bangers. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. I, I, I know one of them, but we'll get to that. Tell me this, the other banger. 
so you have the glow, obviously. That's the first one. And then the second one is the in the rhythm of the night or feel the beat of the rhythm of the night. Those are the two. And the second one's probably far more popular than the first because the second one has DeBarge, who actually did uh, record several hits um, in his musical career. Wait, did you can you give me a reminder of what the glow sounds like? When you got the glow, the king, the glow, you know, I, yeah, I'm not going to sing the whole thing. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that one. Could you do a few more lines? <laughs> <laughs> hey, guess what? We'll play it right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Edit. Uh, so, and you did mention Rhythm of the Night. I, guys, good trivia here. Uh, this movie, up for a lot of like uh, Razzies, a lot of bad awards, the worst actor type things that they give out. But this thing was up for a Golden Globe for best original song. Here's your nominees. I want you guys to tell me what the winner is. I know what Saul's vote was for. Um, we Don't Need Another Hero from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Ooh, ooh. A View to Kill from A View to Kill. I don't I don't know that one. Rhythm of the Night, Diane Warren and uh, wrote it, The Last Dragon. The Power of Love from Back to the Future. Okay. Ooh. And from White Knights, Say You, Say Me, Lionel Richie. I'm going to say it should have been, and I'm not even going to be biased on this. It should have been uh the uh, we don't need another hero but i have a feeling it was the back to the future one i think the power of love yeah 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 huey list dude lionel richie say you say me say it for always that's the way it's supposed to be yeah wow i, I gotta think uh, those other two are iconic with those movies yeah, like when I hear the power of love, I immediately think of Michael J. Fox on the hoverboard. Like, dude, Barry, yeah. Gordy, Barry Gordy, probably not too happy about uh, you know having a Motown yeah. Records movie and then not winning it. Uh, yeah. But I, but again, if you believe the internet, he's worth four hundred million dollars. So I don't think he loses any sleep over yeah. the last dragon getting the shaft. Hall of Fame quotes. Mm. Salt. This take Take this, this away. Is, I'm gonna this, this start to finish. So I'm gonna let you take my my quote too. Go for it. <laughs> I mean, you have kiss my converse, obviously. Who's the master is the biggest one. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so. who's your master? Um ooh. What else I like when I liked when the um I don't I don't remember her name, the the faux showgirl who was in training um when she stormed out and she was like, You little asshole. Do you remember that whole quote? Damn. Should have written nope. that one down. I, I I was partial. I know Saul's not a big Richie Green, but you know, he ain't no cornball. He's my brother and he's the master. You know, that was like <laughs> the thing is he was like competitive with his brother. You know, he thought he was somehow gonna woo vanity away from his older, like super hot brother. Which... I like a uh, hot head needs cool water. <laughs> And he sticks our Eddie Arcadian's face in the piranha tank. Well, this is one of those movies that I feel like has a cult following, kind of. Oh, absolutely it does. Time. This is like the this is like the classic version of that. It's like one of these movies people quote, and you have no idea where the quote originated, but everyone says it, so you know it. Oh, yeah, it's definitely if you look at Alamo Draft House, once a year they'll have a Last Dragon Night. And in in that space, one of us three is having the best day ever so just so you know a little bit more about Saul. Uh, <laughs> um, oh 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 the the third best quote in the whole movie oh i don't know why i didn't forget uh, think of this but playtime's over boy <laughs> yeah that i mean when he comes out and he's all glowed up i'm like oh shit here we go <laughs> that's when the movie is at its peak right there when Shonuff and Leroy battle. Woo! And then the music and the theme, just the... Doo -doo -doo. Oh, man, I get all hyped up every time I think about it. I get goosebumps right now just thinking did you Did you see this movie in the theater? Me? Yeah. No, I was like five. Well, I don't know. I just... I, I just, like, wanted... Like, Roger Ebert gives this movie two and a half stars, by the way, and, like, he, like, talks... Like, this movie actually has... It was a fairly expensive movie to make. It gets a lot of credit for, like, the special effects... I don't, I mean, that like that fight scene now is, you know, it doesn't like hold up super well, but in its time, pretty good. Now it looks like a Power Rangers fight, pretty much, you know? Oh, I don't know about that. I think it's better than that. 
Oh, it's not better than that. It still holds up well. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I don't know what movie you guys watch, but it, it wasn't this one. So have you ever dressed as one of these characters for Halloween? <sighs> no, I've always wanted to, but I can never find like the I, w- I would always I would dress up as Shona. That's yeah, you I would, I would that's wear. where I was going with that question. Is I yeah. think you make a wonderful show now with the yeah. yeah, with the shoulder pads. Yeah, absolutely. The metal shoulder pads and the waistband. Yeah. That was like the look in the 80s, too. You had to have shoulder pads if you were an evil oh, villain. If you, you know, Josh Josh, re- Josh referenced Vanity earlier, and she was in the, I'm going to say, in one of the worst movies ever made of all time that could include two people that were relatively, one of them was going to be on, was going to head to future stardom in John Stamos and then mm-hmm. Vanity and Never Too Young to Die. If you ever watch that trailer, prepare to watch the worst trailer of all time. Gene Simmons as the bad guy, he wears shoulder pads. Oh, it's awful. Just an awful, awful movie. Are you going to try and convince us it's a sports movie next? No. My, like, I, what I want, so last thing we usually talk about on the show is to write the sequel. I would like a show enough prequel. You know, they made Joker. Joker was up for Hell like that yeah. picture. Now, Julius Carey was the actor that played Show Enough. He is no longer with us. He's also in another famous sports movie, The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh, which is the Dr. J movie from the 1970s, a basketball movie, which is actually a real sports movie, unlike this one that Saul made us watch, but he can't play it. So let's write the sequel. Let's write the Show Enough sequel. First of all, oh, wait, first, wait. first of all, whoa, 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 whoa. You know that this almost got relaunched, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think like any of these movies that have like a cult following, there's always like a rumor that they're going to go back. And you know, Samuel just sitting on L, somebody's desk. Samuel L. Jackson was going to play Show Enough. Now I did that, not know that. That is, yeah, absolutely. So, Kelman, you're thinking we're going Star Wars, like do the do the sequel as Show Enough's prequel yeah i want to know how he became because i'm not sure what his motivation is when i watch this movie again other than just being the baddest master in new york city but like i would like to see like i'm interested in his henchmen i'm interested in he is by far the most interesting thing about this movie like saul's probably like a daddy green guy he's like i want to hear about the pizza place like how did that how did that place come to be but i'm all in on i'm all in on show enough he steals every scene that he's in his he's giant. He's six five. Like he's a good, he's just a good badass actor. So first of all, good presence like, in every scene. Like he's got to have a tragic backstory, you know. Like I don't think like good father figure. You know, he's got like a he's got like a Cobra Kai. You know, he's got a Cobra Kai dude who kind of turned him dark. You know, Darth yeah. Vader. He's got the Emperor or something. So first of all, so who's, who would you cast right now as uh, you know, Baby Show Enough, the Muppet Baby version of? show enough Ooh, oh who's a young you know i probably like uh maybe a michael b jordan or somebody like that you know gotta be gotta be younger you know uh but he's not that tall so who's a tall character who's a tall actor that could play that role i'm not sure i know one right i think now. that would be a little more eccentric than than that too michael b jordan's very kind of very stoic he wouldn't i don't think he'd be well suited in that role yeah that's true yeah i don't know who else you would put in that role yeah, you're. We can cast Eddie Murphy there, can't we? Uh, maybe we can just go like opposite world and just put anybody in there. And uh, since they don't have an acting background, since Time Act didn't, let's put Kelly Oubre in there. How about that, Kelly Oubre as Show Enough, <laughs> or 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 Kelly Oubre as as uh, Bruce Leroy. Mm. Yeah, I like there that. We go. Now you're onto something. Because like, yeah, I mean, you, I'm thinking like. Uh, um, like Donald Glover, you know, Donald Glover is like famous, you know, I don't know, Ooh, he's like yeah. a big character, but I kind of like him. He would play like, the hell out of that role too. Who's playing Vanity? I actually, I know this. I know this because I actually think if you're going to play someone who had a single name, you're going to have to have a single name. So Zendaya, she's in Spider-Man Homecoming. She's awesome in that. She yeah. can sing because you know, you got to have tunes in the sequel. So I like I like Zendaya and Glover. You know he's a musician. So you got you would hit both up. 
That's I would. I, I, I like that. that. And he's got a performing name, right? That Don Glover has a performing name. So Childish, Childish Gambino. Yeah, exactly. So does. like you could do like Gambino's and Daya in the prequel. I dude, I think it's solid. That's. I, I mean, I, it's not bad. I like Rihanna. You know, I think Rihanna's a single digit. You yeah. know, single word name. So Maybe any single name, any yeah. single name. But but that innocence, since I, you know, she played like a high schooler, so I like the the innocent role. So and she uh, can she can sing and she can dance. So perfect. But can she wear the feathery costume? Can she do that? He's her hair to be that big. Hells yeah. <laughs> uh, out of hair. All, right. all the hair used up. In I want the floating down from the top and the whole bad dancing and everything. I want it all. So I want your guys' final thoughts on this movie. I got one. I'm going to go first if you don't mind. Go ahead. My takeaway to this movie is I'm going to compare this to another thing that I love that change norms on its head. And that's, I love Hamilton. The idea of Hamilton was like, why does it have to be a white guy that plays George Washington? Why does a white guy have to play this or that? And they, they flip that, they, they flip those norms on its head. And I think that's something that's really cool about this movie. Like they had Asian actors playing like the black actors in the city, you know, gambling. And it's, it, I'm not sure, like this movie does not get made in 2020. Not like this anyway, not with the stereotypes, but I did like the idea, like, why does it have to be, why do we have to cast it exactly the way we've always done it? Like Hamilton did that. That's one of the things I love about it. And now I've just compared the thing that won a Pulitzer Prize to The Last Dragon. So uh, <laughs> Chris, come full circle. You're, turning, you're quickly turning into Saul here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and how do I unsay a thing I said? Kristen, your final thoughts on The Last Dragon. My final thoughts on The Last Dragon in... I'm just thankful I I was not born in the 80s and didn't have to uh, sit through any more of these 80s films. Oh, but you will. Oh, you will. I, <laughs> Eventually, I, watched, the movie. I watched Rocky IV. I watched The Last Dragon, and it just is not doing it for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, she has a point. We, you know, between Josh and I, we have picked pretty much predominantly 80s movies, except for one of the four so and you picked dodgeball which was not an 80s movie and i assume you're not going to pick another 80s movie okay. here coming up so well, you're I like i i'm choking on the hairspray at this point <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of hairspray this Saul, final thoughts this was your movie you 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 brought the zeitgeist back what do you think about the last dragon you know this is just one of those movies where you just can't take yourself seriously you just watch it for what it is it's just it's just you know it, it's junk food it's junk food it's absolute junk food. And yeah, sometimes you just want to sit down and have yourself a little bag of gummy worms. You know, it's okay. It's all right, Kristen. You just got to open yourself up and just let it happen. There it goes. So that's what I think. Oh, man. All right, guys. So that that is Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. This is another episode of The Real MVP in the books. Saul, Kristen, thank you guys. Check out the rest of our podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening to us. And uh, thanks a lot, guys.